Do you want to learn how to market solder? Today's video, I'm going to teach you. We're going to go through the three main skills you need to learn to market solder, things you have to practice over and over so you can master these skills because you have to first master the soldering part before you can start diagnosing and doing more advanced repairs. So the three main things you want to master is pulling and placing ICs, reballing, and running jumpers. These three skills are things you're gonna use throughout most micro soldering repairs. So if you can master these, you basically can do a lot of repairs. So one of the benefits to using a six plus touch disease device for practice is these phones are old, so they're super cheap to buy. You can probably buy iCloud locked boards or dead boards for under $5 each. You can probably buy working, fully working devices, maybe under in the 30 or $40 range. And it's very crucial that you practice on boards, you know, iCloud lock boards, dead boards first, so you get your hand skills and get the used to the process. Then you move on to actually working boards so you can go through the process and make sure everything works afterwards. So today's video, we're gonna walk through kind of the whole thought process on how to practice micro soldering, how to repair this iPhone 6 Plus that has no touch, and just general tips on learning how to solder. So hi, I'm Jesse from VCC Board Repairs. Smash the like button if you like these videos. Subscribe to the channel. Check out the links down below in the description because I will link to all my tools that we use in today's video. Also, these t-shirts as well. So if you want to support the channel, pick up a t-shirt. All right, guys, so let's get started. So first, let's go over the tools you need to do this repair. I just launched my new website, vccboardrepairs.com. And if you go to uh, products and services and then tools, you'll land on this page. These are my recommended tools that I use here every day. Um, these are tools that I recommend you buy if you're gonna start soldering. Don't get the cheap stuff and then think about upgrading later. Might as well just bite the bullet and get it now. You'll probably spend about $1,500 total with you know, hot air station, soldering irons, uh, DC power supply, you know, the microscope, but it'll be worth it. You know, it's an investment, you're running a business, so it'll pay off real quick, especially if you put in a lot of effort and time into mastering these skills that we'll show in today's video. So check it out. Let me know what you guys think. Did I leave any tools out? Just let me know down below in the comments. So just browse through it. I have a lot of stuff. I spent a lot of time manually adding each one. So would appreciate your guys' feedback. So let's go to the actual motherboard and get started. All right, so here's the iPhone 6 Plus motherboard. Um, so like I mentioned, the main skills you wanna learn is pulling and placing ICs. This is kind of the basic, most common skill you'll be using. Um, so I'll be using here my tool 3D tweezers. We need to get, for iPhone 6 Plus, we need to get underneath the sticker here. So just going through this process, you're also going to learn other things just as a side effect, like working under the microscope and then peel off this sticker like that. So what I like to do is just kind of fold it over. That way I can put it back after. So I just fold it like that and then here we go. So. You don't need to learn too much about you know what this chip does or anything. The goal is to just practice these going through the motions of these uh, skills. So this specific chip, this black chip that says starts with TI and some number, this is the Mason Touch IC. This is what causes no touch on an iPhone 6 Plus. So my recommendation is, you know, if you're a repair shop, you most likely have a bunch of donor boards. Basically, donor boards are motherboards that don't turn on. They're just like boards that get left behind. You know, I have a giant stack of them here that I just collected over the years. You know, people, you know, abandon their phones or you buy, you know, a iCloud locked phone for, to take a screen or housing off of, and then you have a spare motherboard now. So if you need to buy any, just post it in my Facebook group, which is linked down below, VCC. Uh, it's called the Phone Repair Community by VCC Board Repairs. So you can search for that as well. So the, the main skill you wanna learn is how to pull the IC and then once we're done, placing it. The key here is 
being able to pull this chip without disturbing any of the surrounding components. Then also, we're gonna use some Amtec flux. I use the NC559 ASM flux. I buy this from Injured Gadgets. When you're buying flux, make sure you buy from legitimate sources. Use Amtec for whatever reason. People, uh, companies will make, you know, uh, counterfeits. But if you get good quality flux, then it makes the job a lot easier. So the, the trick here to remove or pull an IC is this. You add flux all around. It could just be one side. The next is my quick 861DW hot air station. I'm gonna use 865 Celsius with 65 air. So with the quick hot air station, I basically have three, three settings I use, um, 330 Celsius, 365, and 400, just based on the job I'm doing. So this is something you do have to practice as well, kind of understanding your heats and temperatures. So to remove the IC, essentially you just heat it up like this and go in circles. You don't want to concentrate your heat in one spot. And then for uh, six plus touch IC, there's a Wi-Fi chip here. So you want to point away from it. You also want to be mindful that there's other components on the up opposite side of the board. And then keep an eye on the flux. You see how it kind of moves around and it bubbles. Based on the behavior, you kind of get an idea whether it's ready to be removed. So I'm going to grab my tweezers. I have my hand planted on the bench and then my fingers here have control of the tweezers, right? So I have it grabbed. So now I could gently, literally just gently wiggle the board. Do I see the chip move? No, so I just keep hitting it with hot air. Keep hitting it with hot air and just kind of gently wiggle. You wanna put very minimal pressure on the IC, otherwise you can damage it. And just keep going in circles. So this is something you have to practice a lot of times so you can kind of be able to move the hot air in circles and keep your other hand steady. And essentially keep going. There it goes. It lifted right off. So this is something, you know, get a dead board, pull as many chips as you can without damaging them. As you can see, the chip is not damaged on the edges. It's real easy to damage the IC if you don't grab the chip uh, correctly with your tweezers. Also, you'll see I did not bump any surrounding components. So when you're new, it's real easy to be grabbing the chip and then the solder balls will melt. And then what will happen is the your tweezers will just move and then you'll bump a big row of components and all that. So this is something you have to practice. There's no, there's no shortcuts to this. There's literally hours of practice you need to put in. So like the reflection is really bright, right? So when the thing, the chip comes loose, it's easy to just kind of your hand to twitch like that and just bump like everything around it. And since you had so much heat on there, what's going to happen is, the um, you know the surrounding components, the solder will also be molten, so it'll it's easy to mess up the whole thing. This is why you practice on dead boards first, then you practice on iCloud log boards first because they turn on even though you can't use it. You can at least turn it on. You have touch. You could get some function out of it. So the key is go through the process and then test it. If it still turns on, everything functions as nothing changed, then you know. You did a good job. If you go through this process and then the phone is dead, it doesn't turn on no matter what, then something went wrong, grab another board, try it again. And then once you kind of mastered it on iCloud lock boards, that's where you get a real board. You know, you buy, you can just buy a fully working iPhone 6 Plus, do the uh, Touch IC job even though Touch is working, and then test it after, make sure Touch keeps working. That tells you uh, you didn't mess up anything. All right, so here's the IC. Let me put it off to the side. Another part of 
pulling and placing ICs is prepping the pads. All right, so you get some, you add some flux and then you get some solder wire. I will also link it down below. This is the Kester uh, 60, what is it? This is the Kester 63, 6337 rosin core. So it's 183 Celsius solder. So this is lower temperature than the factory solder. Then I'm gonna use my uh, Hackle soldering iron. This is the BC1 tip. So it's very large, but also it has a flat side. So it makes it really easy to apply a lot of heat to the board. Essentially the goal of this part is to run your iron over each pad to replace the solder that's already there. And the key or a trick is to keep rotating the board so you're always at a good angle. You don't wanna press down hard at all on the board. You want this bubble of solder that's on the tip of the iron to do all the work. So as this bubble of solder goes over the pads, it kinda essentially uh, sucks up the solder that's on the board and basically replaces it with your solder or replaces a lot of it. And this is also very tricky. If you have any troubles, like the blobs of solder that are building up, like little mountains and blobs, most likely you don't have enough flux or not enough heat. So my Hackle FM203 is set to 750 Fahrenheit. So once we kind of prep the pads and kind of flatten them out, they look pretty even to me. So let me add some isopropyl alcohol and a toothbrush. This is just a kid's toothbrush, the softest bristles there is. All right. And, and ideally you want to do this right after you pull the IC. That way the board is still hot and it makes it a lot easier to prep the pads. If you wait like I did, cause I was talking, uh, it might be colder and then it might be a little more uh, difficult to flow the solder over each pad and not have giant you know, blobs. Okay, so you can see, if you look closely, you'll be able to notice uh, you know, the uniform shape of each pad. You want them to look like this. It doesn't have to be perfectly flat, but as long as each pad is individual little circle there's no like spike or like blobs of solder going across from each other. So this is basically good to go. So I'll just go straight to the jumper part. So this is probably the hardest part of soldering is mastering the jumpers. So for this specific repair, we need to run the jumper 100% of the time, every single time. So we can have a uh, reliable device with reliable touch. So what you do is when the board is laid out like this, this pad right here, the M1 pad is what's weak and causes no touch. So the goal here is to kind of scratch out this portion of the pad or trace and basically recreate it so that, because right here is where it fails so if we just kind of recreate it and bypass the, the trace that was designed into the board and essentially replace it with our jumper wire, then we don't have to worry about that disconnection to happen. So there's many ways you can do this. I just like to scratch out all this. So it does take a lot of hand skill and practice to kind of be able to scratch out very accurately just the part you need. As you can see, there's traces everywhere. So my recommendation to practice this is get a dead board, pull the IC, and essentially scratch out every single trace without going outside of the lines. You know, for example, like scratch out this one, scratch out this one, just go all the way around and do them all just so you get the hang of this hand movement. That way when you have to do like one of these, it's a lot easier. And I'm using uh, ex uh, scalpel blade number 11 with you know, a scalpel handle. 
as well. So you gotta be careful. You gotta be real gentle and just scratch enough until you start seeing the copper trace being exposed. And be careful not to scratch, uh, you know, the outside part. So once we have that exposed, we wanna add some flux. And then I'm gonna use my micro pencil this time. I'm using the K, K tip or knife tip that is like flat and angled, which is really nice because it's kind of multi-purpose in a way. Okay, so the goal here is to add solder to that trace like that without bridging with the other pads like I just did. So I use my iron to kind of um, move that trace back out of the way. All right, just clean it. I'm cleaning it up so you guys can see a little better of what I did. I hope you guys can see right there. That is the trace that we're gonna basically rebuild um, through a jumper. So, gotta anytime you're soldering, you gotta use flux. You cannot just solder without it, otherwise. The solder doesn't flow where it needs to and you're gonna have a lot of trouble. So next is the actual jumper wire. Um, I use the mechanic jumper wire, which I always have tiny little pieces everywhere. So that's where I grabbed it from, from under my work mats. So there is some lint and whatnot here. Let me try to clean that up. You know what, let me grab a new piece, that way it's more realistic. Okay, so I grabbed a new piece, so this is more realistic to what you're gonna see. So you're gonna have a giant piece like this. For example, like once you cut it out from the wheel, little uh, wheel of jumper wire. So my recommendation is to cut it into a smaller piece, so it's a little more manageable. So I have this giant piece here, I'm just gonna use like this shield right here to press down with my blade. Now I have a much smaller piece that's a lot more manageable than a giant string here that just like flops everywhere and gets out of the way. And then this, I put it under my work mat. I, I'm just using an Amazon underneath this, this mat that the board is on is a Amazon baking mat, like for cookies and stuff. I just use that as like the surface. So, so I actually started with that by itself, but then I got these fancy, you know, work mat on top of that, but it's up to you how you want to do it. Let me know in the comments, you want me to do a, a shop like tour of how I have my whole thing set up, you know, what tools are where and all that. Let me know down below. Don't forget to also smash the like button if you're enjoying this tutorial. All right, so essentially what I'm gonna do is first, we're gonna solder one end of the wire and we're gonna solder it to one end of the trace. So I'm gonna use the little pointy tip of my micro pencil and do a quick tap and try to flow the solder that's on the board onto the wire itself, which I just did. So now that it's soldered on, you can see how I can bump it and it won't disconnect. Then, using my blade as kind of like a pivot point, I put it there and then I could use my tweezer to kind of curve this around. And then I'm gonna kind of curve it like this. This essentially allows me to kind of move the wire out of the way so it doesn't accidentally bridge to something else. And I'm using my tweezers, like I'm pressing down on the board and then using the two fingers of the tweezers to kind of keep the wire in line in place. And then same thing. So when placing jumper wires, do be super quick, do like little quick taps. That way you don't, the heat doesn't transfer to the other end of the wire and then 
that these solders and stuff. So I was able to kind of flow that solder through the solder joints and, or create a solder joint. So although I just did this and it may, maybe it looked real easy to you, the thing is I have a ton of hours practicing this. Uh, it's not something that's just going to come naturally to you. Unfortunately, you have to put in the time and effort to practice this. You know, watch this video over and over so you kind of, you know, in case you miss anything, you'll, you know, pick up on it on the second or third time. I'm not just saying it to get the views, although that is a nice thing is, you know, if you watch this video once and you're trying to learn, you're not going to learn every single little detail that I mentioned. Some things are just going to come in one, one ear and out the other and you're just going to forget. Um, you know, I do have a soldering course. So if you're looking for something that's more formal where you have an actual soldering coach to help you answer any questions as you're working through a job, you want, you know, want to join the live Q and a trainings where I do live repairs with, you know, all the students and, you know, help answer any questions. You know, we have a full documented training portal where like this whole process is, is in way more detail than I'm covering. We have um, kind of like homework and goals we set every week. It, it's a full fledged program. So if you want to learn more about that, make sure you check out the link in the video description for the ProFixer 90 day program. It's 90 days. So, you know, most other courses you hear about, they're like five days. There's no way you can learn all this in five days. We are with you where you go from nothing to doing all these, you know, basic stuff to actually doing real life repairs for paying customers, you know, doing auto IC, sandwich boards, clearing shorts and all that. So want something more formal like that, check out the link down below. If you just want to DIY and kind of try on error, then, you know, keep watching the videos and subscribe. All right, so you can see here how I have the little wire. Basically, one end goes to this side, and I essentially bypass this little trace and then attach to that side. So basically, when I put the chip on there, it'll solder onto that wire, and then that connection is still there, but it's through a wire and through the original trace. But if the original trace fails, the wire is there to create a secondary or backup um, you know, connection. All right, so next is the UV mask. So this stuff is really messy, so I just keep it in a towel like this. This is like a clean cloth towel. And this is the tricky part. So I don't have a plunger in here. I just use my tool, the back of my blade, and essentially push out a little bit. It's kind of hard to see. Uh, would have focused no it won't all right I got some outs so I got a little bubble here at the top dip my blade in there a little bit I don't need that much and then if we go under the microscope you can see how much I picked up very little just a little dot like that tiny little dot and then the trick here is use your blade as like your little platform where you have the UV and then use your tweezer and then go like that. Pick it up from the little spatula or serving tray, I guess, and then touch it on, on here. So the, the thing here is you want to be real mindful of where you're placing that UV liquid onto the board. So you don't want it to go too much under the chip because then you're gonna block the chip from connecting to where it needs to connect so essentially i'm just doing it here on this side something like that then i'm gonna wipe off my blade close my uv liquid and put this away 
you can see how the liquid UV mask is real thin layer. It is as far away from you know the grid of pads. So I'm like pushed up to the right from this angle. It's just coating this side, but the pad is not coated. That's what we want. If you do get some on here, you can scrape it off later. Then you get a UV light. So this specific one, I don't have linked, but I have a very similar one linked just because I don't know where to find this one. But basically the, the idea is the same. It's a giant UV light that will blast the, the board. And what happens is that UV liquid, when it gets hit with that UV light, becomes solidified and essentially grabs onto that jumper wire. So when that UV liquid, UV mask solidifies, it essentially grabs onto the jumper wire so that it won't move when you're soldering the chip back on. So you want to give it a good, you know, 10 to 30 seconds, you know, depend, depending on how much UV liquid you put. Like I said, you want to keep it real thin layer. And there you go, it's installed, it's flat. It is not a little mountain. So this is something I see a lot of uh, new people struggle with. They put, they try to put a little bit and it just ends up a big blob and it, it's like everywhere. Try to be very minimal with your application. It's better do a hundred like small drops than you know one big one and then you ruin it and now you have to like clean the board and then start from scratch. All right, so board is prepped. Now to the fun part, reballing the IC. So this is another, this is probably uh, the thing that I see a lot of people struggle with is reballing ICs. It's not that hard once you kind of know the steps and kind of technique. So first thing is we got to prep the pads just like we did to the board. So anytime you're soldering, you got to add some flux. I'm going to keep a piece of jumper, or not jumper, a piece of solder wire nearby. And essentially use your tweezers to hold the IC. So with my left hand, I'm holding the IC, my right hand. Also, anytime you pick up your iron, stab it into the little brass wire. Anytime you put it back, stab it into the brass wire. That way your tip is always clean and ready to go. So pick up some solder like that. And then just like the pads, you want to be real gentle. Essentially go over all the pads without pressing down on the chip. If you press down, you could damage the surface of the chip and the chip is destroyed or ruined. So you got to be real gentle. All right, some alcohol. And since there's flux on the chip, it kind of is holding it in place. If you have issues where it's moving around, you can just drop some alcohol and then just hold it again. If it does get stuck, you could always apply a little bit of heat to the heat mat and the chip and you'll see it'll come off. So for example, right now it's probably going to be, no, it's not stuck. It just had a lot of flux, but not enough to get it stuck. So also always keep your bench clean and always clean off your old flux. I see a lot of new people who they're like working on a board. Like I get a board after someone tried to fix something which they probably shouldn't have been messing with. And there's just a ton of flux everywhere. If you're trying to solder something and it's not soldering, clean it, reapply new fresh flux and then try again. All right, so you can see, if you look closely, the IC itself and not physically damaged or okay so there is minor damage here in the corner but it's very minimal doesn't seem to go through any layers or anything just the outer edge uh, you see the surface is nice shiny gold no weird uh, defects same for the back well it's kind of dirty but you don't see any chips or anything on the back all right, so the chip is ready to reball. Also, you know, we, we prepped the pads 
and you can see the chip is very flat. Like there's no solder ball sticking out a lot. Now if you do have one that's kind of sticking out more than the others, it might be fine, but you generally want to, you know, stick with, um, or have most of them be flat. All right, so stencils. These are, there's a ton of different stencils out there in the market. Pretty much any should be fine. Um, you know, this one specifically, it, these are old. I don't even know if they make them anymore. These are iPhone 6 IC by Canley, the gold ones. I think Wholesale Gadget Parts may have it. But this one's a 3D version. So you see these little, there's on each side, there's like little uh, kind of holders or alignment posts. But it, but it, the stencil itself is super thin, like a 2D stencil, which means it generally doesn't have, like this was a 2D stencil. Like there's both sides, there's no alignment post, but these are tend to be real thin. And then there's 3D stencils, well, the general, like older style, where there's like huge grooves for each chip, but these are really thick, these original 3D stencils. But Canley came out with a 2D stencil with kind of 3D functionality where it holds the chip in place. And these are pretty nice, but I always get both 2D and 3D because you never know. Sometimes there's a chip that I need to reball that's not exactly the same chip, but the pads on the board are exactly the same, and I'm able to reball this obscure chip. So definitely, you know, it's gonna be one of those things you just always buy and buy. You know, certain brands you'll that you'll try with maybe work better than others. This also happens a lot. All right, so we have this uh, chip on the proper stencil and the proper slots. So although it's not labeled, you just have to eyeball it. You can see, you know, the shape. And you can see this one kind of matches. So lines up, you can see I can kind of slide around and the chip doesn't move. Now also another thing that I forgot to mention is underneath, I have a little clean cloth that I folded uh, in half and then folded in half into a smaller square. So this is a good surface to reball on because it does kind of sink the chip a little bit enough to kind of hold it in place as well. And it just makes it like a, it has like a kind of soft pad underneath effect where it makes it real easy to reball. Definitely recommend you that. If you don't have these clean cloths, then you can do like a paper towel, you know, fold it in half as well. All right, so this is where it goes. Now to the reball itself. So I actually have some paste here already, but to kind of show you guys the process on how to reball, you'll need a tool, a reballing tool. There's many out there on the market. Um, you know, these are the most common that I see for sale now is like these little um, you know, basically reballing application knife thing. Essentially it's a flat blade. It's not sharp, but it's flat. Um, the goal is to scoop up some of this paste from, I'm using the Mechanic 183 temperature solder. Uh, the model number is XG50, yeah. XG50, which is also linked in my website. It's 183 Celsius. This is a key part is the factory solder is like 220 something. This is 183 Celsius. So it's a huge drop in temperature. So when you go to install it, it's a lot easier, a lot less heat to install. It makes things a lot, a lot better. And there's no negative effects to having a lower temp. Um, it, just, it just works a lot better you know, for environmental reasons, you know, the manufacturers, well, actually there's a law that forced manufacturers to use the higher temp, which some people say are the cause of a lot of problems as well. So yeah, what you do is essentially you scoop up, uh, if you can with this tool or use some other tool to scoop up some solder paste. Now, as you can see, I have, you 
essentially an empty bucket here of solder. You could apply it however. I have a different tool that fits in there nicely. I use this one, but I do want to show you what... Actually, let me clean out this tool. All right, so if you do phone repairs, I'm sure you'll find one of these spatula tools. This was in my iFixit kit from like six plus years ago that I got. Um, so, you, so you come in here, you scoop up a little, this should be good enough, like this amount. Then, you know, out of the bucket, it's gonna be real runny or um, liquidy, I guess. Is that the right word? It's not gonna be dry. And, you, and for the best reballing, um, like the best reballing effect, you want it dry. So you can see how up here is real shiny. Hopefully. So the trick is get a paper towel or a clean cloth and literally just press it down into it. This will help absorb some of that. Well, it's actually flux in there. So it'll help absorb some of that flux. There might be a little too much flux in there. So essentially go like this, just press it down, press it down until it's more like a matte or clay-like texture. And you can kind of see there how it's changed. And then do it on a clean part of your cloth. And you will get some lint in the, in the solder paste, but that's fine. It'll burn away as you're reballing. So now you can see the solder paste looks a lot more of a dull color. Uh, if we get them out, might as well. All right, I got most of the lint out. Okay, so let's bring back. Let's put the IC back. Hold on, I'll focus it in a second. All right, so I got the IC lined up. And this is the easy part. Essentially, you know, face the paste down and just spread it like that. And do it again. Rotate the blade. Essentially fill in all the little squares. Then you scrape away that top layer. You just scrape back and forth like that. So essentially you only have what's left in the little squares. If for whatever reason you still have some like paste residue on the outside, if the paste looks a little too too wet, too runny, you could also get another clean cloth and just kind of wipe away the top layer. That helps absorb and kind of dry out the paste in that process as well. Then you want to get some curved tweezers. So these, I don't remember where I got them from, but the you know the, the curved tips are large so essentially I could you know hold it like this essentially right on the outside of the perimeter of the chip and then for reballing I use 330 Celsius and 35 air and my quick 861 DW I do have also the smallest nozzle which I forgot to mention is a six millimeter curved nozzle and then essentially kind of just like how you pull the IC, you want to heat up and kind of heat in circles. Pay attention to the paste itself. And then you can see how it starts kind of reacting to the heat. And then I start, I like to hit it in one corner, like right here in the bottom left. And just go slowly, be patient, and you can see how the balls are forming. There you go. I just easily created some solder balls on this IC. And now here's the trick, is once you see them solidify, they're no longer shiny, let go, and quickly lift up the stencil and poke it out. Otherwise, if you wait too long, what's gonna happen is the flux will, will kind of dry out or solidify, and then it'll be real hard to pop it out. It'll make it 
So you, you basically have to damage the chip to get it out. So, and also while it's still hot, it's good to clean it as well. It really is the flux that kind of the troublemaker here. It makes our life a little difficult. All right, so I've cleaned the stencil. All right, so this is what your reball should look like. If it looks like anything else, then you might have to just redo the, the job. Uh, it could be you weren't holding down the stencil long enough. You didn't put the right amount of paste. Your paste was too, too much liquid or too dry. There's so many different reasons. So this is why, um, you know, formal training does um, help with this where we can walk you through like, you know, some troubleshooting on why your reballing isn't working. But in this case, uh, this one looks good. You can see all the solder balls look uniform. Even if they're not perfectly uniform, in most cases you'll be fine. So yeah, this is a uh, rebuild. So now the placing part. So pulling and placing, you know, we covered the pulling, now to do the placing. This is probably, I keep saying each one is like the, the hard part or the tricky part, but it's all kind of tricky. If, you, if you've never done it before, this is why I'm preaching to buy dead boards or I call lock boards to practice on to just go through the motions. Don't just watch this video, try it once on a donor board and then try it on a customer's board next. You should go through these motions at least 10 times each one of these steps. So pulling and placing, reballing, running jumpers because there's always going to be something that kind of goes wrong and if you don't know how to deal with it, Gonna have a bad time okay so i applied some flux and then one thing i forgot to mention earlier is to keep track of the orientation of the chip so orientation dot is this so this little dot means if you're going to replace the chip or reball and put it back um, this dot should always go in this corner um, if you remember I did mention like all oh, the chips says TI and some numbers and I remember it was like right side up so from this angle it should be right side up like this and then the goal also what you can do is take a bunch of pictures like before and afters or you know during your progress from you know without touching it pulling the chip you know take a picture basically every single step you make every move you make you should take a picture so you can then go back and see, you know, if something went wrong, you have a picture of potentially where something went wrong. All right, so now we have placed the chip. This is where a picture would also be useful is to see your alignment. But in most cases, you should have a uniform gap on most sides. Uh, this side, there's a lot of components that are kind of spread out. So, but on this side up here, this side and this side is kind of all the right, all the same spacing. Then what you do is you have flux underneath. You have to push the chip down. If you don't push it down, then the flux doesn't really make good contact. And then when you go to heat it with hot air, the chip is going to fly away. So the flux kind of acts as a temporary glue. So I'm going to use the same temperature to reinstall it. But if you remember, we have lower temp solder. So now it should install way faster than it took to pull it off. And then just heat it, you know, go in circles, heat up the area. If the chip kind of goes misaligned, you could always just bump it into alignment. Also, my nozzle is probably a good three, four inches away maybe. And essentially, you want to also hear, oops, let me put the nickel over the sticker. You also pay attention to the sound. You could hear the, the airflow hitting the board. So as you get closer, it kind of gets louder. If you get further away, you, you hear less. And 
And pay attention to the flux. Pay attention to the chip. Do you see it moving? Uh oh. Slightly move. This is where it's tricky as a placement because the chip can kind of shift and move around and then you got to redo it, everything all over again. Look at that, look at the chip. You see the flux underneath, it's kind of bubbling. Now I can move closer. And you can see the chip is kind of moving around but doesn't uh, fly away. And if I bump it gently, it snaps back into place. That means the, the solder balls underneath are liquid, the solder balls on the chip are liquid, they've combined, and now surface tension is kind of holding onto each other. So if you bump it, it just kind of stretches and then pulls back. So that means the chip is installed properly and we should be ready to go. So now let's give it a minute to cool down and then we can test and see what happens. All right, so I have partially re reassembled most of it. Uh, I have the screen plugged in. I plug it into the computer so that it can prompt it to boot. And essentially we're gonna wait to see if it boots up and if we have touch. Like I mentioned, you know, the key thing here is to practice. Practice, practice, practice. There's no substitute to it. In this case, we have touch. So I didn't get to where I am today just by watching videos and then thinking about it. I got here by spending hours and hours practicing. You know, I did, I learned mostly by DIY, by watching YouTube videos, by asking questions in the Facebook groups. But, you know, there's a lot of people who watch videos and they think, they just see it, it looks easy. Okay, I'll, I could handle it whenever that comes in. It's not how it works. You will have to go through the motions every single time. So you can see here we have full touch with no dead spots. So you can consider this fixed. All right guys, so quick recap of today's video. One is make sure you have the proper tools. Like I mentioned, check out my website. These are tools I use and recommend. And I would recommend if you're gonna start soldering, just get the right tools right off the bat. Also, they their resale value stays real high. So even if for whatever reason it doesn't work out, you know, this isn't for you, you can sell them at close to retail price. There's always people who want to buy these tools and if they could save a few bucks by buying them lightly used, they will. So definitely, you know, take that into consideration. Next thing is, you know, pulling ICs, you know, prepping pads, running jumpers, reballing. These are all things you physically have to do 10, 20, 30 times to like really master it. I would say before you even touch a working phone to like practice the, you know, the whole process, do it at least five to 10 times. You know, pull an IC, reball it, place it back. Pull an IC, reball it, place it back. Go through this process 10 times, you know. Uh, like I showed you guys, you know, pull an IC, see all the traces that kind of just come from all the different angles, scratch out all those traces, run jumpers for each one, even if it's just and just for the practice of your hand motions, this is something that is not, that you have to practice under the microscope because it's a whole different world when you're under the microscope. And you'll see that if you never saw it before, you're gonna start you know, based on this video. Let me know down below, but you'll see it's a whole different world. Like one tiny little movement is huge in, under the microscope. So it's something to consider. And then also buy some dead iCloud lock boards um, posted in my group that you're looking for some. I do have a few recommendations of people who sell them or just go on eBay. You could find them for maybe a little more than you would find them in the Facebook groups, maybe like 10 to $15. And like I said, once you've got a good feel for this process, you're feeling confident, you can do an iCloud lock board that turns on, you know, go through the whole process multiple times and the phone still stays fully functional, you know, before and after, then you know you have it nailed and now you can get a real board. So my recommendation is buy a, you know, iPhone 6 Plus with touch disease off eBay. You know, it might be 60 to $80, who knows? And whatever the price, buy it, fix it, and then you can resell it later and kind of break even at least. 
you know also what you can do is if you do have a repair shop you know you can quote the customer as if you're going to outsource it you know if they don't want to they're like you know what I, i'm fine or is the price is too high just offer to buy the phone off of them that's how i started a lot of my repairs too like I offered a board repair because at the time I wasn't, I haven't mastered it. I was still learning, so I would still outsource these motherboard repairs. And I would quote them, they would say no, or like, you know, some hesitation. Then I'd offer to buy the phone. And I would buy it like above, you know, a, a price you would normally buy. So kind of higher market value price just because I wanted that phone because it had a motherboard issue. And these are real hard to come across. So if you can buy phones with motherboard issues and you've already mastered or kind of got a good grasp of the fundamentals, then you can start practicing on real boards. You can fix them and either you know, make a little bit of profit or break even. Even if you lose like 20 to $40 after you resell it based on the price you bought it and you fixed it and sold it at a lower price, you still earned or you still went and practiced and mastered a, a specific repair so that you know, this is just an investment into your future so that you know how to solder and then can offer this repair, this service to your customers and make way more money than you lost on those, you know, $20, $40 you lost on a, you know, on a flip that you used to, you know, buy and resell. I mean, you bought to repair and then resell. Even if you bought to repair and it goes bad and it, the phone dies and it doesn't work, now you have a donor board to just do more practice on. A lot of my boards here are also like that. Like I bought it thinking I could fix it. I couldn't or something went wrong or, you know, I had an issue. And then now I have a donor board that I pick parts off of as well. So hopefully you guys found this video helpful. I shared as much as I can about kind of like getting into soldering, you know, what tools, what to practice. So let me know down below in the comments what you guys thought. Don't forget, I will link to all my tools either on my website or down below in the video description. You can find it there. Um, also check out a t-shirt. So if you're enjoying these tutorials, you appreciate me teaching you how to solder, get a t-shirt. You know, I get a small commission off the shirt, but you know, it helps out the channel. So I really appreciate all you guys. Thanks everyone for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one.